All right, so attempt number 320,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three more, three hundred and thirty two million. Oh. All right, so check this out. So today we were looking at Joshua bid them farewell or bid him farewell. Yeah. And now, right now, this is like, <sighs> it's too hot, but it's okay. We're going to have to do the work anyway. All right. So here's what I hear him saying. No one having done a miracle in my name. That's where we stopped. I think I don't remember where we stopped. I'm just going with where we did. Okay. So she was asking something about, um, shoot, man, today was crazy. Father, just have your way. I said you would have your way that you would not allow me to give my private interpretation, but just what you give. In Jesus' name, you're the teacher, I'm the student. We're the student. All right. So we, we covered quite a bit. And we were almost down to the scripture itself. Joshua bid him or them farewell. Um, <laughs> oh, what accent? I'm talking pure Chinese. Pure Chinese. Pure Chinese. Here we go. Just English, just proper English, right? Um, so we're looking at Philippians 2.12. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2.12. <laughs> That's so funny. Verse 11 to 13. Why is it so hot? The sun went down. I'm drinking water like a camel. My hair is up on my head. Not exactly, but I'm putting it up on my head. There we go. Okay. Philippians 2. I can't take this heat. Okay. Somebody give me some ice. Just a second. I need ice. Oh, I see that. This might help. Okay, ice. Yes, ice next to me. Do it. There we go. Okay, so Joshua bid him farewell. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm feeling really warm. Okay, I can't help it. Terrible. All right. <clears throat> And we get serious now. Okay. Philippians 2, verse 11 to 13. And for every tongue, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now in my absence, because this is even deeper, because the Comforter has come already. All right? And he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. When he says continue, it means it's a progressive thing. It continues. It's going on. It's continuing. It's, it's being done. He says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does he mean? Each day you have to crucify the flesh. Each day you're going to have to tell the world no and say yes to God. Each day you're going to have to eat the bread of life. The word of God. Now, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will. It is God inside of you the spirit of god is life and light so no longer do you walk in the darkness if you are allowing jesus to what to ring amen and it says for it is god who works in you the spirit of god working in you in your mind in your heart dealing with all your emotions and everything it says to will to will is to choose, it's a choice, it's a desire to will and to act on behalf of his good pleasure. So not only will you hear the Spirit and not do what the Spirit says, you're going to hear the Spirit and do what the Spirit says. Amen? Spirit of God. All right, now we're going into Galatians 5.24. Okay, let's see what's going on here. 
Galatians 5, 24, verse 23. So we looked at, well, this is the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, these are the fruits of the Spirit. And if we go back one, we'll just read them out. Galatians 5, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Amen? What does that mean? What does that mean, to crucify the flesh with his passions and desires? Whatever the flesh yearns for, it's going to be contrary to God. The flesh does not like God. See, the flesh is at enmity with God. Verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. And we spoke about that. We spoke about it not going before or after, but in step with Him. Walking with Him. Allowing Him to lead. We're looking at Mark. Mark 3.29, verse 28 to 30. Truly, I tell you, the sons of men will be forgiven all sins and blasphemies, as many as they utter. You could battle Jesus as much as you want, you know, and say, well, well, whatever, Jesus, don't do it. That's my daddy. I'm okay, getting angry. Verse 29. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. Now you can't see Jesus anymore. He's in the Spirit. So when you do something wrong and the Spirit convicts you. And you say, ah, uh, my, my imagination. Ah, uh, not that. You know, you push him away. You tell him he's a liar. You call him a liar. Especially when you call people who are speaking what the spirit, the utterance of the spirit, who is speaking the truth, who is speaking the word, when you call them demon-possessed and you call them evil, you, what are you doing? You're calling the spirit of truth a liar. And it says, verse 29 of Mark 3, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin, of eternal sin. I'll be drinking like a camel, by the way. All right. Verse 30. Jesus made this statement because they were claiming he has an unclean spirit. So this is simple to, to understand. Okay, this is not... Um, science. Well, science is easy to understand too. But this is not, um, I don't have a word for it. This is not a test. All right. This is not some big examination that you have to go through to pass. Listen, there, Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. All right. But the spirit inside of them is not. All right. So, what is going on here is a blame game. It's kind of like the spirit that is a lie and of darkness hates the spirit that is light and the truth. So what are they doing? What are they doing? The Bible tells us that in the last days, what would they do? They call bitter sweet and sweet bitter, good evil and evil good. That's the defining factor. When someone is speaking the truth to you out of the spirit's uttering, or Jesus speaking in the spirit, because it's Jesus in the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. When he's speaking and you shut him up, or you say no, or you say, you know, that's a lie, or what evil, or Jazebel, or Bacchus, or Hubble, or Bubble, or um, Beelzebub, sorry, not Bubble. <laughs> bubble. There's a demon called Bubble. Yep, that's true. 
The Bible says that. The Bible says get married if you cannot control that desire of the flesh. Um, when it comes to sexual things. Here we go. Verse 30. So Jesus made this statement because they were claiming he has an unclean spirit. So imagine they call my daddy unclean. They said he was demon possessed. What do, they, what do you expect them to call you? Holy? No. Because it's not you they're attacking. It's him. The spirit inside of, it's not them. It's not the flesh. It's the spirit working in the flesh. So it's that spirit that is opposing him who is inside of us. See how that works? All right. So then he took us into God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So when they think they got it all figured out, God is about to show up and do something totally different. All right? All the theologians and the Bible scholars and there you go. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 28. Even Pastor, you know Pastor does? He sits there and he goes like, why didn't, this is curry favor. He's like, you know, you, you get favored by God. I'm like, well, how are you, why are you saying that? He says, because I had to study four years in college, in Bible college, and I didn't learn that. <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 48. Brothers, consider the time of your calling. Can each one of us go back in time a little bit and remember when exactly we chose Jesus? When we chose to receive him? When did you receive your calling from the Lord? It says, consider the time of your calling. Like I told you, I was on the ground right there, kneeling, broken up in pieces. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Nope. Not many were powerful. Nope. I was weak. I was in pieces. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose. Who? God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise or to confound the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. So it's like, hmm, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The strong and the muscular, right? Hmm. Uh, one name comes to mind, but I'm not going to... Okay, stop grinning, Terry. The strong and the muscular, right? So they carry a cross, right? 40 pounds, 50 pounds, cross. And then... When it's time for them to really step up, can they really carry the real cross? The real cross is not even 5 pounds. It's not even 3 pounds. Can they really carry it? No. Look at that. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Even he said, he said, there's none who has, there's none, how do you say, there's none that has been more blessed than John the Baptist who have been born of women, but those who, the least of these, the kingdom of heaven belongs to something like that. We're going to go there and check it out now. It says he chose the lowly and despised things of this world. What does that mean? Well, he was despised. He was um, not esteemed. He was for he was for he was we esteemed him forsaken, a man of sorrows. Is he looking at him? God gonna use him? You sure? Him? Joseph's son? You should but look at it. Oh. Couldn't be her? God gonna use her? You sure about that? Listen, the things that are rejected. What am I? Totally rejected. I hate it. Um, he chose the lowly and despised things of the world, things that the world will not esteem. So what is the world like? The world like glamour and, and beauty and gold and money and the, world, the worldly things, right? Fame and all this kind of nonsense. Is he choosing, is he choosing someone that is um, famous? That is, he can, use, he can do that if he wants it, by the way. But he doesn't because he wants... The, you see, it's like him speaking in parables, but now he's putting out his thoughts, which are countless towards this, in action by the Spirit. Oh, that was good. Say it again. I can't say it again. What did I say? Okay, so he's taking the things that are rejected of the world and he's rising them up. It's like him saying, listen, 
You humble yourself, you're going to be exalted. You exalt yourself, you're going to be brought low. Verse 28, he chose the lowly and despised things of the world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. What are the things that are not? Spiritual things. So, you could preach all you want. You could prophesy all you want. You could speak in tongues all you want. But if you have not love, and this is not, I love you so much. You sure? Mm-hmm. I'm hungry. Can I have a piece of your sandwich? No. Do you see that? That's how some people are. I love you so much. I'm cold. Do you have an extra jacket? Mm -hmm. Can I have it? No. Uh oh. If he have not love, then he is like a clanging symbol. You know? It's a, one of those things, ding, 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 but it doesn't have a beat, so it's ding, ding. Like if you take two trash can covers and you bang it, ah. yeah, not good. He chose the lowly and despised things of the world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Fruits of the Spirit. What did he call us to bear again? Fruits of what? Not of the world. Fruits of the Spirit. He calls us to bear fruit of the spirit it's not if you have a car and you have a house and you have money and you have this and you have that and a family and kids no you have to be a fruit of the root that holds you up which is who christ jesus he says i'm the root of salvation are you being fruit patience check long suffering check Self-control, which you can an ice cream, not really. Temper, I'm working on that. Love, yes. Kindness, yes. Faithfulness, yes. Check out yourself. Write down the fruits of the Spirit. I want you to do something. I hear, well, I'm going to do it too. He says, write down the fruits of the Spirit. And I want you, like each one, with more, no more than two words, no more than two words, you're going to write your weakness towards that thing. All right? So that's one word. All right. He chose the lowly and despised things of the world and things that are not to nullify the things that are. It was spiritual things that destroyed the things, um, the... The, up, the, up, the exalted things. The cross, for example. The next thing we heard was Isaiah 53, too. He was despised and rejected. He had no cleanness. That when we saw him, we would desire him. We look at preachers on the pulpits, and they're all decked off in ties and suits and shiny shoes. Jesus preached with sawdust and a raggedy clothes. Or a, a piece of robe on him. He went barefoot. Or with sandals. All around the place. He, he, he blended in. into. That's why when, when he said he grew up as a tender root out of dry ground. A tender root. Hmm. I hear him saying carrot. <laughs> carrot. I hear big carrots. Okay. So carrots need nutrients to grow, right? I don't think, I don't know. I've never grown a carrot, to be honest. But um, that's what was funny. But um, listen, to grow a carrot, right? What do you need? You need nutrients in the ground, right? But if a ground is dry, it's not supposed to, nothing good is supposed to come out of that, right? Because nothing can survive. It's, there's nothing. There's no water. There's no nutrients. Nothing. But then imagine out of desert ground, you saw like fresh carrot tops, and then we pull it out, it's the most beautiful carrot you ever saw. Check that out. Like a root out of dry ground. You don't see it coming. You don't see it coming. 
he had no stately form or majesty. So it says, who has believed our report? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who knows what God is doing? He grew up before him, a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no stately form or majesty to attract us. No beauty that we should desire him. So how are we going to know that we should listen to him? How do we know that he's the Messiah? Well, look at his fruits. Look at his spirit. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was sad. Why? Because he was, in his heart, he wanted none to perish. You think that that's why every time, like when he shows his face to me, he's like, he's always in prayer. Or he's always kind of like, this morning he was smiling, big, big smile. But he was like, like down and just kind of like, like if he's praying. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He was hated by everybody and his own did not receive him. Now, he's, he, he speak, he's speaking to the, the arguers, you know, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And That's heaven. He, he's speaking to them. <clears throat> he's speaking to them, and it's like, they're like, well, Abraham was before you, so who are you? Do you think you know more than Abraham? Really? So we're looking at John 8, 47 to 59. And he said these words, the beautiful words. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And here we go. So John 8, 47. He was of God. Here's God's words. <clears throat> For he knew who he would choose or who he had chosen from before the foundations of the world. Let me just try and just get back. Just. For he knew beforehand, this is what I hear, who he would choose before the foundations of the world. Ephesians 1, 4. Just a second. Bless Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Verse 4, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless 